What we're talking about today is compassion, and the title is The Art of Compassion. And you know, we, I create these titles, and I don't really know exactly what, what does that mean, The Art of Compassion. And so for those of you who know me, you know that my favorite source, or one of my favorite sources for information is Wikipedia. So I went to Wikipedia, and I looked up what is compassion. So I'm going to read a little bit um, about Wikipedia and what Wikipedia, what we say compassion is. Because it's my understanding that at Wikipedia we all put our information in and then what comes out is collective consciousness, right? So this is what we say compassion is. Compassion motivates people to go out of their way to help physical, spiritual, or emotional hurts and pains of another. More involved than empathy, compassion commonly gives rise to an active desire to alleviate another's suffering. This next sentence is the one that really stood out to me. The English noun compassion means to love together with. And I thought, well, how perfect is that, that we are a couple of days before Valentine's Day, and I have a little story to tell about that. You know, I, I love to wear red around Valentine's Day, of course, to honor the love that we are, to honor the celebration of love that Valentine's Day is. And so I put my sweater in my suitcase coming here. You know, I come here and I spend the night because I love spending some time in, in quiet in my hotel room preparing, because that's the way I prepare. I used to prepare by having very detailed notes. And then I realized I didn't use them. <laughs> so then I went to bullet points because I needed that training wheel. And then I realized I didn't use those either. Because even what is occurring and showing up for me on a Saturday evening may not be wants to, what wants to show up here on a Sunday morning. So I, I packed my clothes and I realized I had these pants that looked blue to me. And I love blue and red together. And then I woke up and thought, these kind of look green. So maybe we're celebrating Christmas today, or maybe we're celebrating Valentine's Day. Whatever we're celebrating, the two things that showed up for me in that reading that I would like to talk about today and be with is what is love and what is suffering? Because in the, in the description, it said that compassion is our deep desire, now I'm using my own words, but our deep desire to alleviate another's suffering. So I want to open by talking a little bit about suffering and pain and how, in my experience, they're actually incredibly different things. The way I like to say it is that pain is in the body and suffering is in the mind. And what I mean by that is that pain is a part of this existence for whatever reason. We have physical pain, we have emotional pain, we have mental anguish sometimes, and we have spiritual pain. Suffering, though, is optional. And that, of course, comes from the Buddhist teaching, that pain is inevitable and suffering is optional. So what is suffering? Suffering in my own journey usually looks something like this. It shouldn't be that way. She shouldn't be doing that. He shouldn't be saying that. It should be sunny. <laughs> I love what Byron Katie talks about. For those of you who probably know Byron Katie, she wrote the book Loving What Is, and her story is fantastic and fascinating to me. She lived in Barstow, which apparently is one of the windiest cities in the world, and she said it occurred to her that she was living in Barstow in the world's windiest city, and everyone complained about the wind. <laughs> and she thought, now what could be more insane than living in Barstow? It's like living in Seattle and not liking the mist, right? It's like living in the desert and not liking the heat. And so we always have a choice, right? We can either lean into the experience of whatever's happening, and yes, that sometimes that's pain. So suffering could be simply said as a resistance to that which we say is undesirable, and clinging to something that we feel is desirable or wanted. So the only place then to be free of suffering is to be in a place of neutrality. 
And so when we talk about something like this, people will say, is that possible? Is it possible to not have a preference? Well, my answer is actually, I don't know for sure. But what I do know is that I have more freedom than I've ever had in my life thus far because I'm not clinging to ideas of rightness and wrongness. Now, we have an opportunity right now in our country because, I, and, you know, this doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum. What's happening is we see a lot of divisiveness happening, right? We see a lot of fear. We see a lot of they have it wrong, I have it right. And guess what? Everyone, we all believe we have it right. No one wakes up and thinks, I'm going to cause harm in the world today. Now, maybe there are people that do, but no one I've ever met. <laughs> Most of us want to do something that feels like something good in the world. So we all have a different idea of what that is. Compassion would be allowing someone to have their own perspective. Freedom would be a dedication to releasing my own. So when we go back to compassion, the definition is to alleviate another person's suffering. And I, I loved the quote from the Dalai Lama, that, or maybe it wasn't the Dalai Lama, one of the slides that was up there said that the that, that, uh, suffering must include myself. <coughs> compassion must include wanting to alleviate my own suffering. And so I could use suffering synonymous with my perspective of the world, right? So the next question might be, well, how do we do that? How do I move from a world of duality into a world of oneness? For me, it's, I absolutely question everything I've ever believed, everything I've ever thought. So we talk about the evolution of consciousness. What does that mean? What is consciousness, right? We have consciousness with a capital C, that changeless eternal truth that we might call the essential self. We might call it God, or source, or love. And then we have this human consciousness, this small c consciousness, which is our ability to perceive. That which I can open up to. I had a great teacher, Reverend Maureen Bass. She was a unity minister. And she had such a simple way to define and to demonstrate human consciousness. She would draw on the board a bunch of dots, just a lot of dots. And she would say, these are all the ideas, beliefs, and perspectives in the world. And here are, here's us we this little circle around four dots. And we can grow in consciousness by opening up to seeing more of that, and more of that, and more of that. So the expansion of consciousness is allowing ourselves to open up to more possibilities. And what we actually know is that in every moment there's infinite potential and infinite possibility. And as soon as I decide it's this, that's what it is just like I decided these pants were blue, <laughs> right? And someone else might see them as green, and I'm actually going to use this as an opportunity, and it's kind of ironic, because I tell a story in my book about blue and green, because it was a very real experience I had some years back where someone was in an argument about the color of a chair. <laughs> so when we talk about the levels of conscious awareness, I, 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 in my book I write about four levels of conscious awareness. I call them martyr magical thinking, metaphysical, and mystical. So whether we're talking about my pants or the chair, the blue or the green, this is what it would look like. Level one, martyr consciousness, I'm right and you are wrong. Now it could be you are right and I am wrong. That's still at that same level of consciousness. I know I walked around for many years believing I was broken, wrong, and damaged in some way. That was living firmly in that martyr or victim consciousness. So part of my evolution was to recognize, wow, that's not true. So at that level of consciousness, we argue, we fight, we say we're right, and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong. We move into what we might call magical thinking, right, which is I make things happen. At that level, we might say, 
I know I'm right, <laughs> but I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> I'm going to love and accept that you have a different perspective. <laughs> but we lean in and say, I know I'm right. <laughs> And that's an important level of our awareness, of our, of our growth, because we have stopped fighting. Right? So we can see, if you look at, at, at like what's happening in the country, wouldn't it be great if more of us at least did that step? We could at least <laughs> stop fighting, right? Even though we could whisper, I know I'm still right. We move into this next level of consciousness and we begin to recognize that it is perspective that I see it as blue and someone else sees it as green, but neither one of us are wrong. We just have a different viewpoint. And our viewpoints come from a lot of different things, where we grew up, the religion we grew up in, our socioeconomic status, everything, our race, all of those factors are factored into how we would perceive. So at that level of consciousness, we begin to have compassion. It's okay if you see it differently than I do. Not only do I not need to argue, but I don't need to lean in and say, I still know I'm right. <laughs> we honor that it's, everyone has their own viewpoint. And then we arrive at this mystical level of consciousness, and we recognize that it literally doesn't matter if that chair is blue or green. I, in my own journey, realized that I had spent most of my life focused on something that didn't matter. So what is it like? For us to step into that and to know that we can actually release the ideas of rightness and wrongness. I'm thinking of Rumi's beautiful quote, there is a field out beyond rightness and wrongness, I will meet you there. And that's the mystical field that we're talking about. We literally recognize that there's no separation, that we're all different aspects of the one power, the one presence. And that, yes, that includes someone that might look different than me politically regardless of where you land on the spectrum. So we check in with ourselves. Am I arguing? Am I fighting? Am I whispering I'm still right? Am I acknowledging and honoring that people can have a different perspective based on a lot of criteria, including their own development? See, that with that holds a whole judgment. I love that one too, right? In spiritual circles, we'll say, well, you know, just once someone evolves more, they'll see it my way. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so we, we do that because there, there's a thing that I hear sometimes at Unity, and I, you know, there, there's a thing I hear sometimes at, at different metaphysical communities, and that is I'm going to take the high road. And what that means is you're taking the low road. <laughs> that I, because I'm oh so spiritual, have taken the high road here. And within that holds so much judgment. Right? So much judgment. Because what I'm also saying is I'm at a place that's more evolved than you are. So that's the antithesis of compassion. Because ultimate compassion from the spiritual realm, and I promise I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about love, but compassion from the mystical realm is a recognition that the suffering that someone else is experiencing is also mine. And mine is also yours. And so we land at a place where we begin to live in the question, how can I alle alleviate suffering? So if suffering is attachment, how can I be a presence for someone, including myself, letting go of or releasing attachments to what we think of as good or bad or right or wrong? What a beautiful place to land. I don't have to have an opinion anymore about anything. Now, does that mean I don't? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> So that's why we call it a spiritual practice, right? A reminder, oh yeah, when I have an opinion about you or about me or about us or about them, usually it's them, I suffer. It becomes profoundly simple and practical. When I have perspectives about you or me or us or them or right or wrong, I suffer. When I recognize the oneness of all beings, when I recognize and see, as, the, as uh, Gandhi says, if you don't meet, I think I said this the last time I'm here, so I want to repeat it, if you don't see God in the next person you meet, you're probably not going to find God. So that's where we arrive. Yeah, that's where we arrive. So what is love? And what is love from these different levels of consciousness? 
level one for me was, why didn't you love me? I deserved to receive more love than I got. That's why I'm broken. And I want to I want to be clear here. I'm not. I noticed my tone a little bit. I felt a little judgmental for someone that might be in there in that place. I. It's an important place to be. It was for me. It was part of my evolution. It was really, for whatever reason, it was important for me to have a lot of suffering in my life. Not pain. Suffering. And that suffering eventually led to me asking the question, what would it take to be free? Do I want to be free? And then love at this next level might look like, I want to be more loving in the world. I want to learn to receive more love and give more love. And then we arrive at the mystical level. I know I didn't go through all four. There's, we could frame those middle two in some way. But at the mystical level, we recognize that we don't need to love. We don't need to give love or receive love. That we are that. And that's a fundamental different, fundamentally different way of being in the world. Because, you know what? I don't have to fix you or me because we're not broken. Pema Children says it this way, compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded, but between two equals. Only when I know my own darkness well can I be present with the darkness of another. And I'm going to also say, only when, I'm, when I have a, developed a relationship with my light can I be present with your light. Only when I know my own light well can I see the light in you. So from this place, from this place of oneness, this place of absolutely knowing the essential truth of who and what we are, we can be in the world as love and recognize, not only do I not have to have a perspective about you or me or us or them, but I've arrived at a place where I recognize that the work in consciousness is what shifts the world. So in closing, what I want to say from the mystical realm, if we're talking about compassion being a desire to alleviate suffering, what that would mean is I'm going to be loved in the world, and because of that, that will have an impact on every person that I come in contact with. Because Amy is committed to that, I feel that in her presence. That's what I feel at Unity of Brentwood when, when I walk in the door. People dedicated to knowing their own divinity. And when we have a group of people dedicated to knowing our own divinity, that vibration moves outward. That's what changes consciousness on the planet.